Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Levitsky, director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard. Welcome back to our um, weekly Dr. Pass Tuesday webinar. I want to start by welcoming my extraordinary co-chair, Francis Hagopian. Fran, are you there? Francis, how formal. Welcome, everyone. It's great to, great to have we're you doing, with us. We're doing formalities today. Uh, I also want to thank our crack doctor class team of not Pao, but Paula Ibarra, Jillian Scales, and not Gabby, but Gabrielle Patterson, um, as well as our translator. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we start. First of all, we have translation into Spanish. If you prefer to hear uh, the presentations in Spanish, just go to the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, second, as always, we'll be recording today's webinar. It'll be available on the Dr. Class YouTube channel shortly, shortly after the session. And third, if you've got questions for the panelists, we want to hear them, uh, but not through the chat function. That is shut down. So send your question through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we will take your questions and feed them to the panelists in the, the latter part of the of the panel. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, uh, just feel free to, to send it. You don't have to wait to the end. All right, our panel today uh, continues our look at some of the challenges facing contemporary Latin American democracies. And today we look at the seemingly perennial struggle between elected politicians and technocrats in Latin America. Back when I was in grad school a long time ago in the 1990s, the battle between elected politicians and technocrats was declared over and the technocrats had been declared the winner. Uh, but the early 21st century has been a lot less kind, for better or worse, to Latin American technocrats. And maybe maybe they've been more kind to Democrats. Um, our speakers today have worked on at least three countries, Venezuela, Mexico, and Peru, that are now governed by leaders who were elected outside of and to some extent in opposition, opposition to the technocratic elite that dominated their country's politics in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Um, and so the question or a question that we've got is, are we in fact seeing a turn away from technocracy? If so why is that happening? And what are the political and economic consequences of that turn? And to answer these questions, we brought together four scholars who've done great work on this, on the relationship between technocrats and democracy. Uh, most of whom I just noticed got their PhD at UT Austin. Uh, so Kurt Vyland is, is hovering somewhere in the, in the background. Um, I will introduce each of our speakers up front, and I'm going to ask them to speak for about 10 minutes each. And if they are minimally respectful of that, that'll leave us with about a half an hour, 30, 35 minutes for Q&A, during which Fran and I, or excuse me, Francis and I, will uh, take your questions and feed them to the panelists. And we'll try to close by about 120, 125 at the latest. So uh, let me introduce our panelists. I will introduce them in alphabetical order, and that's the order in which they're going to speak. Uh, first of all, Catherine Bursch is the Wallace Assistant Professor of Political Science at Davidson College. Her research, her research is, focuses on democratic quality in developing countries with an emphasis on governance reform and state capacity, mainly but not entirely in, um, in Latin America. Uh, Professor Bursch is the author of the award-winning, multiple award-winning book, uh, When Democracies Deliver, Governance Reform in Latin America, that came out two years ago from Cambridge University Press. Uh, Kate, thanks so much for joining us. Our second speaker is Professor Miguel Centeno, who is Musgrove Professor of Sociology and Vice Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. He's published many articles, chapters, and books on states, war, global capitalism, inequality, and uh, minor issues like that. His recent books include War and Society, Global Capitalism, States in the Developing World and the Extraordinarily Influential Blood and Debt, War in the Nation, which was published almost 20 years ago. Uh, he's finishing a new book project on the sociology of discipline. Now, in an earlier life, Professor Centeno studied technocrats. And in 1997, he published uh, an excellent book called Democracy Within Reason, which was on the rise of technocrats in the still then authoritarian Mexico. Miguel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, our third speaker will be Eduardo Dargent, who is Professor of Political Science at the Catholic University of Peru, where he specializes in comparative politics with an emphasis on Latin America. His research focuses broadly on political regimes, on states and political parties, and he's author of the outstanding book, uh, which I highly recommend, Technocracy and Democracy in Latin America, which came out in 2000, 
15, I believe, with Cambridge University Press. Uh, last but not least, Matthew Rhodes Purdy is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Clemson University. His research draws on democratic theory and social psychology to suggest solutions to difficult puzzles in political behavior. He has researched and published very widely on topics of political attitudes toward political regimes, on populism, on the interaction of political economy and culture. Uh, his regional focus is on Latin America, though he's also uh, explored um, Europe and the United States as well. Matt, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks to all four of you. I will now step aside and turn um, over to Kate. Okay. Uh, first, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to be here today. I'm going to be presenting some of my work with Gabriela Lota at uh, FAGV on the surprising success of Bolsonaro uh, in the political control of the bureaucracy, not necessarily in governing, but in the political control of the bureaucracy. And to preview our argument, we show that strategies of control unfold in predictable dynamics. And to explain this dynamic, we propose an argument that rests on political learning and organizational structure. But if I had to title this just for this, uh, this talk, I would probably have titled it Political Technocrats Against Bureaucratic Technocrats. And we draw a distinction between technocrats in Brazil uh, that I also make in my book, which is, I believe, an important place to start today. Um, I didn't know I would be going first today. I thought Eduardo and Miguel would have set us up and talked about technocrats and then I would have come in and nuanced the conversation. But here I am uh, at the beginning. And so who is a technocrat? You'll notice um, uh, Miguel and Eduardo cited oftenly here. And when we think about technocrats, our definitions that emphasize high ranking policymakers, academic specialization, a sense of shared values, these really resonate with me when I'm thinking of so many uh, of the Latin American countries um, uh, that, that my colleagues here study, Chile, Peru, but I don't think that they fit quite as well when we're thinking about Brazil. And here I'm talking specifically about the federal level. Indeed, we have what I would consider political technocrats, but there's another type of technocrat uh, that also fills high level positions and who also has specialized training. And I have labeled these uh, in my book, permanent or bureaucratic technocrats. While political technocrats might be linked coming and going with presidents um, and are often outsiders, permanent or bureaucratic technocrats can be considered in insiders drawn from the civil service and generally retaining their positions or returning to the bureaucracy uh, in any given presidential um, uh, cycle. And here, I think we have seen a sea change since democratization, at least certainly since uh, O'Donnell noted the bureaucratic authoritarianism in Latin America, which was a marriage between technocrats and military officials. And much of this comes from strong meritocratic uh, recruitment, high level salaries, especially in Brazil but also a sea change, which has meant that many of these spots in the political appointments are reserved for civil servants. And of these civil servants, we see very high levels of academic training, 63% with PhDs, master specialized training. And also I would say a sense of shared values. Many of these individuals came up through the ranks during um, or were initiated into the bureaucracy during an era of democracy where participation, transparency, social control became really strong themes. So why does this matter for uh, thinking about technocracy versus politics? Well, I think it matters, especially in Brazil, because it sets up a battle, a battle for control over the bureaucracy between these two types of what I would consider uh, technocrats. And here you see pictured um, Jair Bolsonaro, so a, a populist with a strong authoritarian tendencies, who's um, uh, pre current president of Brazil, and Ricardo Galvão, who is uh, head of the, um, uh, the National Institute of Space Research, 
that was one of the first and most prominent uh, uh, people speaking out against um, some of the political control of the Bolsonaro government and attempts to cover up deforestation in the Amazon. He later goes on to resign. But in Brazil, we see this battle for control between two sets of technocrats. And at first, many people, including myself, Gabriela, uh, assumed that as it has been the case with many presidents, um, that the bureaucracy would be very hard for presidents to control. I think this was the case um, with Dilma, Josef. Um, it's been the case to a certain extent under Tamer. Um, and it's a real force to be reckoned with, these permanent or bureaucratic technocrats. And at first we see a lot of initial strategies of bureaucrats speaking up, sabotaging um, the, the Bolsonaro uh, administration's efforts of shirking their duties. But over time, uh, we see a different story. And I, I would say in the last two or three years, we see a real sequential imposition of what we call political control. And in our paper, Gabriela and I look at the variety of different tactics that the Bolsonaro government has used to control the bureaucracy, which we argue really started with experimentation in the environmental ministries. And there you see a lot of very um, interesting new tactics uh, uh, that are attempted, ranging from silencing uh, bureaucrats on a collective level to monitoring social media, to what we call starving, either slashing budgets or removing particular tasks from bureaucrats. Uh, and the list goes on and on. And I could go into a lot of these details, but I am gonna try to uh, be disciplined about, about time here. Over time, we see a dissemination of these control tactics, moving from the environmental ministries to a number of other ministries. And here, what you're seeing on the left, um, this is an index that's been created by some civil servants that looks at cases of harassment. And you, if you look at the top, some of this is hard to read, I know. But if you look at the top, we see a lot of the institutes and ministries that are related to the environment. Um, and as we see a dissemination of control tactics, we see political technocrats sharing the, their ideas, spreading um, spreading their attempts uh, uh, to control what is known as the permanent or, or, uh, or bureaucratic technocrats. So we see a process of, of learning over time. And I think one of the big questions a lot of us are asking is, will we see administrative reform? Much of this back and forth dynamic between uh, political technocrats and bureaucratic technocrats has been sustained because bureaucratic uh, technocrats have stability. And so I think that's a, a big outstanding question. In the paper, we also look at how, how did political technocrats outmove or bureaucratic technocrats? And we emphasize political learning. One way in which they did so was really leveraging uh, the pandemic. There was a moment when a lot of the interviews uh, that Gabriella has done, over 100 interviews with uh, public sector workers, at first, a lot of the efforts to resist political technocrats um, were uh, born out through collective action, going to the minister's door, working together with colleagues. And a lot of that slowed during the pandemic. And I think in many cases, um, uh, political technocrats leveraged that. Also maximizing individual repercussions and simultaneously reducing areas of contestation or areas that bureaucrats could turn to has been able to, political technocrats have been better able to induce public sector workers to remain silent or loyal and to implement the president's preferred policy uh, preferences. And so we see this shift over time from informal tactics to increasingly formal tactics taking on um, uh, uh, challenging civil servants legally, et cetera. And finally, I think the other way in which uh, this has been propelled has been the organization, the military hierarchy that has been inserted into the executive, especially areas such as the public, uh, the human resources department. You now have to get permission to take vacation. It's very difficult to take vacation for many public sector workers that they are trying to control. And we see around 6,000 uh, 6, military individuals in politically uh, appointed positions. And so what, what can we conclude? I know I've focused specifically on bureaucracy in Brazil, uh, 
But I think one very important point is that technocracy comes in many forms. And some of these are inherently political. Some of them are inherently partisan, but others seek to increase participation, to advance the public interest, to defend democracy. And that's what I've labeled as more permanent and bureaucratic um, technocrats. Certainly these are not a monolith, not all permanent technocrats in Brazil follow this model, but I think understanding where we get these different types of technocracy and when and why they are at odds with politics versus encouraging participation um, is a very fruitful avenue to, to think about and for future research. And I'll end my comments there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Our second speaker is Miguel Centeno. Miguel, you ready? All right, thank you so much. Now, uh, Kate, you've made it very hard for us to go over time because you showed such discipline yourself. So thank you very much, you've made it really hard. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and my PowerPoint is really not any kind of uh, nice images or illustrations, but it's just easier for me to read. Um, so what's the problem? The problem that was presented to me uh, uh, when I was invited to this, what, what were the prospects of democracy in the 21st century? And not just in Latin America, but across the world. And I decided, and I think Catherine has, has, has also saw it this way, Rather than focus on democracy as an ideal, I'm going to speak about the prospect for politics. And we can define politics as the debate about the distribution of rare resources. And politics represents a possibility and a risk of turning zero-sum games into non-zero-sum games. Politicians, their job is essentially to take a zero-sum situation and try to make it into a non-zero-sum. That also has its risks. Uh, that arena of debate, of conflict, of resolution, I would argue is being assaulted from two sides, not just in Latin America, but all over the world, populism and technocracy. And here I'm following a Bickerton's analysis of, of, of a lot of this. So what do we mean by populism? This is where careers get destroyed trying to define populism, but uh, it's a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. Uh, there is an implied emphasis uh, on the presumed equality of all recognized, and this is important, who is recognized as citizen. Uh, the position of citizen is elevated over and above all others who may reside in the country, and certainly out of it. And there's implicit and often explicit, and this is certainly the last 10 years, uh, signals about whom does not belong, uh, immigrants, the rich, et cetera. Technocracy, on the other hand, is, and I'm just taking this uh, 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 from the standard definitions, it's ruled by technical experts or a powerful technical elite. Sovereignty or power does not derive from the accumulated preferences of the citizens, that's sort of the core of, of, of politics, but from the unique ability of a group of platonic guardians to identify the optimal policy direction and impose it on a population. So government seeks to find the best optimal solution for the aggregate. That's essentially what technocrats are supposed to be uh, about. Now, are all technocrats neoliberals? And certainly in the last 20, 30 years in Latin America, uh, uh, it was associated with neoliberalism. I think the technocratic temptation does not have to be neoliberal. Uh, early forms of Leninism, for example, if you want uh, Lenin's romance with robots, for example, or uh, Leninist uh, uh, romance with uh, Taylorism uh, is an example of a technocratic approach. Uh, leftist revolutions from above, uh, Peru in 1968, or more progressive experts, ECLA in, in the 50s and the 60s, they could be seen as technocrats. What they share is a set of policy and analytical toolkits which help determine their definition of national problems. That is, they, they share a set of lenses. Now, they might be colored in different colors, but they, 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 they give the same definition. And the technocratic mentality encompasses a psychological predisposition towards specific types of rationality and discourse. Uh, to use one of my favorite social science books, the, 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 uh, the, guide to Hitchhike, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, technocrats are really obsessed by the number 42. Uh, they don't really care what the question is, but man, if you've got a precise number, that's what they want. Whatever that number may be, they recognize each other in that. Technocratic values and rhetoric, technocratic policy rationales dismiss the inherent antagonism between classes or groups as irrelevant. 
they believe that a belief that conflicts can be resolved or better yet circumvented through the optimization of resources. You guys don't have to fight. Here's a solution which allows us both to get it. Classes, interest groups, and individuals are in conflict because resources are distributed inefficiently. What we really want is a more efficient distribution of these resources. The integration of their interests through systemic management will eliminate social struggle by improving the lot of all. And those of you I know who, for example, have been reading uh, Lenin, you should recognize that there's a lot of, there's a lot of Leninist uh, 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 element behind this. Now, this implies a rejection of the give and take of politics. The objectivity of scientific truth must conquer the subjectivity of interest. Uh, the good of the whole must also come before its individual parts. Of course, who gets to define who that whole is, et cetera, we could talk about this. Now, are populists the uh, ideological opposites of, of technocrats? In Latin America, yes, but certainly in interwar Europe, no. Uh, the close link between populism and right-wing authoritarianism in, in, in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s. And actually, if you, if you look at the origins of, of populism, it, it doesn't come from the left. It actually comes from Mannheim's idea of conservative thought. It's a rejection of the natural law derived from timeless reason. Uh, it, it seeks to populism, if we, if we accept the sort of genealogy of, of populism, it comes almost from a romantic reaction uh, and claiming the particularity of history. It rejects any kind of universal principles. Um, and, and, and the reason is both limited and historically conditioned. There is no, you know, they, they are the enemies of an intro econ, okay, where everything is universal and everything is, 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 is global. What are populist values in rhetoric? It's a resurgence, we certainly have seen this in the last 20 years, of what we might call identity populism. And that's where before the point of populism was to assert the authority of the everyday folks, los de abajo. Uh, it's now centered on the defense of one type of identity over another. Real Americans is, is perhaps the best example of this. Uh, it's no longer that the pe it's people against the dominant class, but the authentic folk against the cosmopolitan elite more concerned with global order and with them than with domestic distribution. Uh, it's a defense, populism essentially is a defense of tribal interests. Uh, the tribes will be defined different ways but it's against about, again, again, against this universality of, of values. So in populism, the interests of the people take precedence over any and all other values. These interests are recognized as particular and specific to the group. Technocracy relies on the idea that there's a universal truth or value. It's, there's a state of epistemological perfection that, uh, that will produce the ideal policy. And a critical difference, not between technocracy and populism, but much more fundamental between technocracy, populism, and politics. Populism contends that there is a single good for the people that is perverted by the compromises of democracy or the compromises of the elite. Uh, in this way, populism shares technocracy's abhorrence with compromise and the particularity of interest. It says, never mind this compromise, what you're doing is betraying the interests of the people, or you'll be, you're betraying uh, this ultimate reason in the case of, of the technocrats. And I wanna argue um, that you almost need a new, a, a third set of political axes. You've got, of course, the left and the right, and you've got universal suffrage versus single ruler. But to almost think about the legitimating principle of regimes, are regimes legitimating themselves by reference to some supposedly empirical or absolute value we have done this, we have done the, the, the other, or are they defending themselves because they actually uh, are defending the interests of, of some group? And let me just give you some examples and I'm almost done. So third way, uh, Clinton Blair is a combination of techn technocratic legitimation. That is, look at what we're doing, we're doing it right, we've got budgets under control, et cetera. Developmentalism is equally technocratic, but with lower degrees of, of democracy. Uh, high Stalinism would be very far to the technocratic end, far from the democratic participation and far to the left. And populist regimes may be defined by universal truth, now defined as the will of the people, and then a technique. It's an ambiguous, they each have ambiguous relationships with democracy and an and, and openness to any kind of, 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 of political position. So I wanna suggest a sort of categorical equivalence. We can talk about technocrats as globalists, 
And what they're really interested in is system maintenance. Certainly Clinton Blair is a perfect example of this. They're, they're you know, the famous time cover of the committee to save the world. Um, just to make sure that the system works. Populists, on the other hand, talk about individual outcomes for their particular countries. Well, that might work for the system, but it means that this class or this group is, is getting screwed. Politicians, in an ideal sense, are about managing these conflict, conflicting interests. To me, politics is about how do you bargain? How do you compromise between a set of national principles, let's say, and global system maintenance? And that is that talent of compromise, that, that this predisposition to talking about both is, is what's, what's, what's under threat. So my conclusions is, uh, it, it, we're living in increasing, uh, increasingly in a system with system-wide effects. The stuff I'm working on now is called global systemic risk about how your neighbor's house being on fire means your house is gonna be on fire. Technocracy would suggest global measures. Let's, let's regulate COVID across, you know, epidemiologically for 7 billion people. But as we know with COVID, for example, citizenship remains territorial and tribal. So we've got this contradiction between we're living in a system, but my system is bigger than your system, or my system is more important than your system, or my concerns are more. Populists see representation of those individual territorial or tribal or local sources of legitimacy. The group that I'm interested in, that I, I think are, are in, and overall across the world are in threat, is the politicians that seek to manage this conflict between the local, the global and the local. They want some kind of compromise between what is systemically important and what is locally feasible. And that is precisely that talent pool or, or that group that I think are being squeezed on, on both sides. And with that, I think I made it in time. I'll stop. Not bad. Our third speaker is Professor Eduardo Dargent. Thank you, Steve. And let me see if I can check. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here with colleagues and friends. Uh, so I, I took the invitation to try to to think about uh, new topics on this technocracy, uh, politicians, uh, all debate and, uh, and, and uh, related to power and their relevance in Latin America. So I, I, I let me put the, the clock so I don't miss this. So I will try to present five quick points in 10 minutes. First, we, we, we all have suffered this question of who is a technocrat No, It's like very difficult to, 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 to have a perfect definition, but I believe we, we all look at these highly trained individuals that contrast with the normal bureaucracy as a way to be safe and, and, and to know that we're looking at technocrats. In the 90s, this look a lot with economic experts, many of them coming from outside the state to implement neoliberal reforms, uh, usually ministers of economics, no? that were broadly seen as very powerful in a time of crisis, economic crisis. Uh, Miguel's book uh, with, uh, with Silva, the, look at this kind of technocratic democracies. No? Uh, I believe the 90s overlook first previous cases of uh, highly trained technical actors uh, that implemented developmental recipes in the past in Latin America. They were also, I think, technocrats, but didn't caught so much attention as the, as the 90s technocrats. And also, as, as Kate was mentioning, technocratic areas within the, uh, the state, in the developmental state, there were many planning departments that were highly technical. Uh, and other areas like census and, 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 and other offices that maybe didn't caught the attention of the economic technology in the 90s, but nonetheless presented similar uh, dynamics no? as, uh, as did these uh, neoliberal technocrats. And after the 90s technocratic wave, we also started uh, to see less neoliberal technocrats, but nonetheless powerful in controlling politicians. Uh, Kirchner didn't get rid of uh, Nestor Kirchner of technocrats, of neoliberal technocrats, and went all the way to controlling more the economy. He brought in some uh, less ne neoliberal technocrats that nonetheless still controlled Kirchner a lot for those uh, first years. So in the last year, I think we are discussing much more uh, 
the different kind of uh, technocrats we can see in the regions, still we, we differ between normal bureaucracy and higher expertise. And I, 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 I think Kate is correct. We're looking more into uh, technocratic areas of the state with this kind of bureaucratic experts that come much less from outside the state. And in that line, uh, Kate coming first kind of blew this uh, uh, first uh, idea is that I think she's exactly right. These are very different political actors, the insiders and the outsiders. And it was interesting to look at how they can fight between them and the different type of resistance that can uh, be found within the state. Uh, sometimes uh, you need political technocrats to find bureaucratic technocrats and push for reform. Uh, second, uh, I think we are still uh, discussing a lot about the old debate about technocratic autonomy or technocratic resilience. No? What build this technocratic space, in, especially in economic are areas? Why presidents that come to power with this strong idea of changing everything or with populist appeals or even mentioning neoliberal technocrats or uh, all kinds of economic responsibility of neoliberalism against the will of the people, nonetheless, respect certain technocratic control. Uh, the, the biggest example is Evo Morales. No? The current president of Bolivia, Arce, was his minister of economics for a long time and was able to keep the grip under uh, some economic uh, control of many, many issues in Bolivia. No? Uh, how that happened? So I think another interesting question is, what are the constraints for this uh, technocratic, uh, uh, for these populist presidents to nonetheless respect uh, technocratic power and why this is going on. Uh, with Rodrigo Barnechea, we discussed a two-step model of how to predict, uh, with only nine cases, but nonetheless to predict, uh, <laughs> when will you keep a technocrat, even if you are a populist leader? And we, dist we distinguish between left-wing and right-wing populists. Right-wing populists have an investment in, uh, an investment in, uh, and showing some sort of economic responsibility. So they are, can tend to be more friendly with economic experts in, uh, in, in economic areas, while left-wing populists tend to be more open to fighting with economic uh, experts. But nonetheless, we see how in many cases, constraint, economic constraint and crisis constraint prevent uh, left-wing populists from getting rid of technocrats. And uh, I see we see this constraint with Pedro Castillo right now. He has he appointed a minister of economic, which is on the left, but still is able to control the economy and look for uh, policies that keep Peru uh, a middle income country with a lot of investments, uh, foreign investment, still look reasonable. And it's a constant fight between the minister of economic and other political allies in this regard. No? Nonetheless, Chavez and Kirchner or Cristina Fernandez uh, show that these limits can be broken when there are good economic times. No? Third, uh, my book didn't predict to have this, so many experts in other policy areas, especially social policy areas. My explanation in the book uh, was for to understand technocratic autonomy was uh, based on the idea that when powerful interest uh, uh, protect these policy areas as the economy, uh, you will have more technocratic space and you will have more demand for technocrats. Nonetheless, in the last year, you have more technocrats in social policy areas, education, uh, uh, health, health reform. Peru has a, social, a ministry of social uh, services that is full of technocrats. Colombia health in the last year has been full of technocrats. I can say that, yes, my, 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 my theory can explain for that. And uh, somehow it can, but I think... Uh, to be honest, these are much more technocrats than in my time, uh, 15 years ago, and we have to discuss more why this happened. Fourth, and related with the, uh, with the above point, uh, we have to talk about the technocratic legitimacy. No? Why, uh, why is it so easy to point to experts many times as uh, signals of uh, old politics and the sometimes conservative politics? No? how uh, I think also experts in many countries have lost touch with this political demand that they have to accomplish. In Peru, for example, quite frequently tech, tech expert, experts sound as 
this is the best you can get within reason, okay? We are here to provide the best policy you can get. And we know politics is much more demanding than that. So how in some countries experts have become easy targets. Uh, Matt's uh, work on Chile, for example, is a good example of that. Easy targets of you are not responding to bigger demands. And part of your obligation here is to try to think outside the box because politics is also a, a, has a problem of legitimacy. If you turn from technocrats that present solutions and hopes to technocrats that defend conservatism, and this is the best you can get, there seems to be more open space for conflict, no? And I, we have seen this in Latin America with conservative populism, but also in the European Union uh, with uh, these uh, uh, criticisms to technocratic cabinets, no? In, in parliamentary regimes, usually we talk about technocratic, technocrats as technocratic cabinets, and that, a difference that doesn't translate easily to Latin America or from Latin America to Europe. But in many in cases, this is European Union policies and uh, the idea of having expert control in the economy that make them easy targets for, uh, for uh, populist uh, uh, politicians from the left or from the right, no? So the dance between populists and experts, when do they lose legitimacy? When do they gain them? Why they keep their power in some countries and not in others? Uh, seems to be an interesting dance to study these days. And here Miguel's and Matthew's work seems to be on the spot on the right time and in the right place. And finally, uh, why is this relevant? Uh, apart from our academic interest, I think there's a big question about bureaucratic reform these days. No? Stronger bureaucracies uh, uh, make that technologies cause less surprise. We, if we rise the level of bureaucracies, then we will have more people looking as technocrats and acting as technocrats, but at the same time, with more stability, with bureaucratic careers that have an effect in the whole bureaucracy. We seem to be quite far from this technical level. I, I, I like a lot this uh, graph in Brazil about uh, autonomy and capacity that Gabriela Lota and uh, her collaborators do. And we look at some agencies that are highly technocratic, but we also look to agencies that are far away from that. And, and this bring up all questions tackled by Centeno, Evans, and others in the, in the 90s, is how to make uh, the benefits of technocracy, because there are benefits in having technocracy and strong uh, technocratic areas in the book, more general. And how sometimes having these areas do not add to have better bureaucracies, but allow politicians to escape from the big the, uh, reform question of how do I reform a bureaucracy? If I can fix things with small technocracies, there seems to take out the steam from thinking about bureaucracies. And so this is not a, this is not a spillover effect that you have technocracies and that will spill over the state. I think we have to recognize that we can have technocracies and very far away bureaucracies. And there seems to be an interesting question to see in what countries the gap has been able to be reduced. Thank you very much. I think I did it in, on time. Thanks, Eduardo. Um, now we have Matt. Hi, everyone. So I too will, of course, try and uh, maintain discipline as much as possible. Uh, I just need to share my PowerPoint one moment. Ah, there we are. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, Eduardo actually alluded uh, to some of my work on the issues of techno technocracy and technocratic legitimacy in Chile, uh, which is what I'd like to talk to about today. Uh, the main reason, because in some ways, Chile represents uh, what I'm calling here the hidden risks of technocracy. One of the defenses of technocracy, despite the fact that it sort of strays from ideas, as Miguel mentioned, of popular sovereignty and popular control over politics, is that it is somehow more sort of responsible or more stable or otherwise a safer way of doing governance than the rough and tumble of democratic politics. And one thing that the uh, recent social uprising in Chile, these, uh, prote these protests that uh, were often chaotic and sometimes violent show, in my opinion, and based on my research, is that technocracy actually is much less stable than it appears. It's sort of deceptive. It appears much more stable until it's not. And, and uh, its, its stability can erode really rapidly as we saw in Chile. So, just a bit of background about the social uprising. Um, Chile is arguably one of the most successful cases of, of, of technocratic governance uh, 
uh, in the developing world. Uh, if you just look at any economic st statistic you might like to, whether it's unemployment levels or poverty reduction or economic growth, Chile is sort of the envy of the developing world, certainly uh, among the best in Latin America and often among the top in the world. However, despite this, uh, Chile has had consistent problems in the new democratic period with weak regime support, weak support and trust in institutions, and has suffered from periodic bouts of extremely contentious, uh, disruptive contentious politics, including uh, repeated uh, instances of student protests, protests over transit in 2007, and of course, the most recent uprising that began in 2019. So in 2019, uh, the uprising was originally triggered by a small increase in transit fares. Uh, it was eventually made worse uh, because the government had a very sort of dismissive attitude towards the protests. Uh, and then also referred to them as uh, almost, almost sort of internal enemies. They used very dehumanizing language to describe the protests and the police response being as violent as it was, uh, triggered even greater protests and eventually sort of shifted public opinion away. And in order to uh, try and stem the tide and reduce the damage of these protests and, and erode the social crisis, the government eventually consented to a referendum on drafting a new constitution. That referendum eventually received 78.28% uh, of the vote. So it was a massive consensus in favor of rewriting the constitution and doing so with a method that would largely sideline current political actors and parties. So the interesting phenomena here is the fact that you have a system that is arguably more successful than any other in Latin America. And yet people went out into the streets in huge numbers, fought with police, took major personal risks in order to get rid of this system, to overturn it, to, to wipe the slate clean and, and start with something new. So the question is, why would so many Chileans be in favor of junking a political system that was otherwise so successful? And my research focuses on the role of uh, voice and democratic legitimacy to explain this. Uh, I'm gonna go really quick here, happy to discuss the details more in Q&A. Um, most of us, I think, are familiar with Hirschman's work on voice and uh, the idea of democratic voice is inspired by that. The one thing I do wanna point out is that democracies are different because voice is at least partly binding. Uh, one of the difference between voice as exercised in firms or in other hierarchical contexts and democracy is that the voice of stakeholders has some direct role in determining politics, whether that's through elections or, or other mechanisms. Uh, Chile, again, Chile is a very effective technocracy, but one of the characteristics of technocracy is that it more or less requires the marginalization of voice. The entire point of technocracy is to, and, and Miguel went into this in great detail, so I, don't, I, I won't belabor the point, but it's to allow decision-making on the base of technical knowledge as opposed to citizen demands. And uh, again, Chilean democracy really enforces the rule of both political and bureaucratic technocrats in that it minimizes the ability of citizens to exert control or influence the course of politics. And it does this through a really complicated system of interlocking institutions that include uh, the electoral system. Again, a lot of Chile's a rapidly evolving environment. So many of these have changed very recently. Uh, Supermajority requirements of the constitution as well as the role of the courts. You know, I have a paper with Fernando Rosenblatt that just came out in Perspectives that goes into detail here. But for the, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I'll simply say that the end result of all these interlocking institutions is a situation in which reform or change to any major issue of politics, including the economy, uh, cannot be achieved through mobilization of the public or through sort of democratic contestation and, and concerns over interest. Instead, it involves, uh, it, it involves intra-elite bargaining between the left and the right. Generally, if the left wants to make reforms to what has been a very conservative economic system, it generally has to achieve buy-in from the right through negotiation. And the result of that dynamic is that there are strong incentives for the left to marginalize and minimize the role of voice in that system by keeping, keeping grassroots organizations and uh, base level militants at arm's length. Any kind of mobilization can be uh, threatening or provocative and can, and can complicate negotiations with the political right, which can make reform more difficult. And there's very limited potential in the system as it exists now 
for such mobilization to affect real policy change. So this is a major problem because as my research shows, and this is really sort of the common thread of most of the research I've been doing you know, since I was a grad student and from my professional career, is that voice is a, is a essential component of democratic legitimacy, particularly if we conceptualize legitimacy or regime support in kind of Eastonian terms as a reservoir of support that states can draw from to get through difficult times. So even if people aren't happy with an existing political search situation because of you know, a recession or some kind of instability, they'll stay loyal and continue to support the regime through that difficult time instead of withdrawing support and perhaps throwing their support to populists. So just in various works that I've done, I've found uh, among other things that a lack of voice weakens regime support directly. It tends to exacerbate the negative influence of policy problems or economic problems on regime support. It also actually changes people's perceptions of economic outcomes. So it, people who lack voice can take relatively minor economic problems such as some of the issues with social services in Chile and they can get blown up and become major economic problems in people's minds. So it actually influences economic perceptions. Uh, weak voice is also associated with a host of anti-system attitudes and behaviors, including uh, support for populists, belief in conspiracy theories, as well as support for the far right. And we have it, uh, I have in, in a book that's currently under advanced contract with Cambridge University Press, uh, an analysis that shows that it is in fact associated with support for and participation in protests related to the social uprising. So just to conclude, uh, technocracy tends to face very grave challenges in legitimating itself. Technocratic regi regimes that emphasize technocracy have a significant, and I would argue, fairly insurmountable legitimacy problem, no matter how effective they are. And this is why the case of Chile is really interesting. In some ways, it's an ideal test of how technocratic regimes can build and maintain support, because it's a situation in which voice really is minimized, but the effectiveness of technocracy is really maximized. Its ability to, de to deliver substantial policy goods and substantial policy goods across the social spectrum. Remember, technocracy in Chile was developed mostly over 20 years of, rule of governments from the center left. And so while they were certainly sort of neoliberal leaning, they were not necessarily unaware or un inattentive to the needs of people on the, the lower end of the economic distribution. But even in Chile, even in a system that effective, genuine legitimacy, again, defined as regime support that can endure over periods of crisis, just, just wasn't there. What we see in Chile instead is this up and down sort of periods of quiet punctuated by periods of massive and very disruptive protests, which is essentially what according to, to my research is what we would expect from a high functioning technocracy because support or approval is there during the good times when the regime is delivering goods, when things are going well, when things are improving, people will, they may not be you know, over the moon joyful about the democratic regime, but they certainly won't go out of their way to challenge it either. They'll uh, sort of nod their heads and go along and, and mostly turn, uh, mostly it brings apathy rather than antipathy. However, that support is both fragile and shallow. It tends to erode at a moment's notice. Uh, even very small economic problems can lead to what appear on the outside to be very disproportionate responses. I mean, the, the instance of a very small transit fare leading to these incredibly violent and chaotic riots being an ideal example. <clears throat> and so relying on expertise and, and, and the effective delivery of, of political goods or of sort of maximizing the common good, even if technocracies do exactly what they're supposed to, unless they are perfect all the time, they are going to have a very difficult time maintaining support in the long run and they can run into problems very quickly and very unexpectedly. Um, that said, uh, I don't think we can sort of dispense with technocracy, particularly the, the more states modernize and the more we move from sort of industrial to post-industrial production, policy expertise becomes an absolute necessity. There are just, you know, a lot of technical details that ordinary citizens just aren't able to, uh, you know, adjudicate on or, or have intelligent opinions on. So I think the real 
challenge of modern democracies is trying to balance uh, voice with technocratic policy expertise. And I think a couple, I know Miguel and a couple of people have alluded to this idea of technocracy as technical skill, but also as a set of values. Kate also mentioned this in hers, these shared values. And I think that's conceptually, at least that's a place where you can see where you might sort of circumscribe the role of technocrats. So on technical issues, sort of how do you achieve goals? That's certainly a role for technocrats, but on what the goal should be, uh, you know, whose interests should take precedent over whose or how you deal with these conflict over values. I think the problem comes in when technocrats have these assumed values when in fact those values reflect a certain societal interest, um, typically those of the upper or at least upper middle classes. That's, that's the problem. So sort of values should be subject to political contestation while technocracy handles the details of implementing those values and turning them into policy. Again, I realize that's very vague and I'm happy to talk about specifics more in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, but I, according to my clock, I'm about out of time. So I'll conclude it there. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matt. You guys were actually really good time-wise, I think in all time records. So we are um, able to have about a little over half an hour of, of Q&A, which is great. Uh, for the first round of questions, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Fran. Great. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to all of our panelists. I really enjoyed um, hearing all of your presentations, as I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, and so I'm going to just start this round with just a few of the questions that we've gotten. So hopefully we'll have time for a second round and maybe toss in one of my own. So um, the first question comes from June Ehrlich, who's asking about the role of technocracy in policy continuity. She um, puts an interesting question on this, and that is what happens in countries with one term with one term presidencies where there's term limits, term limited presidents? Do we see um, is technocracy a vehicle for policy continuity? Um, responsiveness? I mean, it's 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 a question. Um, a second question. Um, from Brian Palmer-Rubin asks, um, what about the relationship between technocracy and inequality? Um, on the one hand, in um, all the, the countries that have been presented so far, he um, seizes oligarchies and asks um, whether or not confronting inequality might in itself require technocratic expertise do you need to know something about industrial policy or redistributive policy? Um, or is it the case that, as Miguel uh, mentioned, the technocrats have a system maintenance orientation? This would dovetail with June's question. Um, and I'll just throw in a third question <clears throat> um, from Maria Pilar Garcia Guadilla, who asks whether or not conflicts at different levels of government might um, make a difference. What happens when there's a conflict between level between um, technocrats at the national, regional, or local level? I'd like to, if, I, if you'll indulge me, ask my own question. And that is, <clears throat> um, there's sort of a assumption here that once presidents um, either inherit or import technocrats, that there's a struggle for power between technocrats and political actors. And my question is whether this is some kind of technocratic coup or whether it's a handover. Um, I'm reminded when Aylwin became president of Chile that he um, basically said, I don't spend the money, Alejandro Foxley does. Um, and I'm wondering whether um, they, whether presidents hide behind technocrats in much the same way Latin American presidents used to hide behind the IMF in order to undertake stabilization. It was, I would give you a pay raise, public sector workers, but the IMF won't let me. So I'm just wondering how autonomous technocrats um, really are. And I've got another question, but I'm going to hold that back so that we give a chance, give you all a chance to speak and we give Steve a chance to ask a round of questions as well. 
and you can go in the same order in which you present it. And you don't have to answer every question. You can just answer the ones that you feel you've got something to comment on. Kate? Thanks for the, thanks for the great questions. Um, uh, I'm going to start with uh, June's policy continuity question, because I think this is a really interesting, um, uh, there's a really interesting dynamic that splitting the concept of technocrats between political and bureaucratic uh, technocrats can be helpful for. Um, you know, I think that especially where you have one term presidents or alternation in power and where you see massive swings in who the political technocrats are. I'm even just thinking of Argentina in this case and um, how you see the bureaucracy uh, transform with each uh, administration. I think this is really different from a situation where you have more bureaucratic technocrats like Brazil, where a massive amount of the people in the government stay there uh, from, from term to term. And so I think that technocracy, as we think about it, or as I think about it in terms of political technocracy, people who come and go, I think it is a big problem for continuity and for policy continuity. And you see it when you talk to people who are interested in health or transport policy, they have a very hard time with the fact that, you know, if, if massive amounts of people are coming and going, it's really hard to know what the previous administration has done uh, and, and, and maintain that continuity um, uh, over, over time. I'll also make a comment about the, the levels of government and technocracy. I mean, we see this certainly in, in Brazil uh, where you have the health sector, SUS, and the technocrats at the higher levels have to work with technocrats at the states and even at the municipal levels. Um, I think that that can set up a, a real conflictual situation, especially when you have very different values of different uh, technocrats, you know, especially when you have certain economic technocrats that might be um, uh, at odds with those that support social development roles. And I'll hold my comments there and let my colleagues answer some of these other great questions. Okay, I'm talking muted. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate. Um, and who was second? Was it? It was Miguel. Uh, um, just very, very quickly, I think technocrats are by, it would be interesting to look at the epistemological questions of this, but I suspect technocrats are oftentimes very conservative, not in the sense of an ideological position, but they want to maintain the order. Uh, what's one of the standard lines that you would hear in the 1980s uh, during the debt crisis? You have to be reasonable, you have to be mature, you have to be responsible and pay your debts. And technocrats, I think, do provide some kind of policy continuity simply because they don't like chaos. I, I think, I mean, again, we could do public surveys on this, but I think there's, there's a resistance to any kind of radical change. So in that way, I think they are policy continuity. The technocracy versus inequality, this is where I think it's important not to associate technocrats just with the, the, the neoliberal. I can see a technocratic argument for inequality basically based not on growth, let's say, but basically saying, guys, if we have all these people living this badly and they're aware of it, we're going to have a political problem. So let's take it as a technocratic, we have to solve inequality in a technocratic way. I, I, now, who knows what that might look like? But I, I, I don't think the technocrats would be opposed to that. They would just reframe it in a different way. They would just, again, system maintenance. System maintenance can be left, it can be right, it can be center, as long as the, 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 the emphasis is on maintaining the system. Uh, just last point on conflicts across different levels and struggles between technocrats and politicians. We've been watching this. We don't have to go to Latin America for the last year and a half. Uh, Fauci and uh, every single GOP local politician is a perfect example of this, of this kind of stuff. And actually a really nice example of the contrast between technocrats who say, look, it makes sense to put a mask on and whatever, versus a populist that says, hey, you don't tread on me, you da 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 da. And the failure of a political space to say, look guys, can we, can we somehow compromise between individual personal freedom and social epidemiology? That's where we've been missing. We, we have these two sort of ends and they don't really speak to each other very, very well. 
Thank Great. you, Sarah. And, and, and I just I would just toss in that um, as an example of these technocrats who um, pr who promoted policies to reduce inequality in the country that you um, know and study technocrats in the 1990s, Santiago Levy um, created Progresa and Julio Frank um, with a different government set up a national healthcare system. And these were two of the most important inequality reducing programs that I can think of in Mexico in recent years. Eduardo, por favor. Uh, yeah, the, the, the continuity question is a great question. I don't have a clear answer. I'm debating with myself. On the one hand, uh, once you have these technocratic groups controlling an area and implementing policies, uh, you can find a lot of continuity. No? You can find a lot of this is the right thing, uh, way of doing things. In unequal societies, this comes many times with uh, we hire people that look like us, that have our credentials, and uh, that, that reinforce this cultural bureaucratic values in certain areas. And of course, then it's very difficult to change, uh, to change the, 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 the policies, especially if you keep your mind with the idea that you, don't, you have to be careful with expenditure, you have to be careful. In Peru, it took a long time for experts to adopt uh, poverty reducing policy, for example, because it was not in their mindset to do it, even if it undermined the legitimacy of the regime. At the same time, I, we can also think of a lot of examples in which change have come with economic, uh, sorry, with technocratic teams that get into a sector, usually a sector with very weak bureaucracies, and push for change and are able to, uh, re, to build a new system. No, and well, I guess the, the, the challenge there is how, how, how to keep technocracy in touch with change and to be able to adapt with, with other areas and to make the area stronger just than the technocratic area. Finally, inequality, I think, is a key question. Yeah, I just mentioned the, the problem of having expert looking and working and just talking to experts. This is highly problematic at, uh, because of their own legitimacy. I, I, I mentioned the idea of conservatism. This is the best you can get. This is the best you can get within reason. You are living in a good world. The problem is that you don't realize it. We could be worse. That doesn't work in politics. And at the same time, there is an implementation problem in the, in the, in the territory. No? Many of these recipes at the national level will have to go down into regions and, and to the local uh, areas in which you will not have similar technocratic uh, conditions. So I always wonder there how much of what is designed on the top is able to really translate to the bottom uh, efficiently. No? This brings us back to uh, good enough governance and Mary Lee Grindle's ideas. Of, uh, maybe it's better to have a okay solution than a perfect one that is not able to translate uh, to, to, to the territory or to other kind of bureaucracies. Okay, wonderful. And Matt. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think the, the questions about techno, uh, technocracy and policy continuity are a good one. Um, it, again, just coming at it from my perspective, it seems like it would be, but again, the risk there is deriving, in my opinion, from the legitimacy problem, where you can have technocratic regimes that provide policy continuity by resisting voice and by resisting reform, and then eventually dissatisfaction grows to a point where the whole thing collapses. I mean, again, that's how I see the Chilean case. I think one of the ironic things is if the Chilean case had been more responsive and reformed more, at the end point, you probably would have had more continuity. You would not have had this dramatic sort of collapse of the political system where they're rewriting the constitution and more recently what appears to be the collapse of the party system where you know two political outsiders from the far left and the far right seem poised to take the first and second place uh, in the round of election. Um, Miguel, I like that you brought up the case of, of the United States and, and technocratic responses to the pandemic. I would actually, push even a little bit harder on that because you get to a point where legitimacy is so low and these anti-system values take root that there is no negotiation between personal freedom and, and dealing with the pandemic because that issue, in my opinion, has nothing to do with personal freedom. It's not an ideological issue. It is, as you alluded to earlier, it is a tribal issue. Commies wear masks, <laughs> to put it bluntly. It's these things cease to become policies and become signifiers of tribal membership. Um, uh, I actually have a piece of the, the book we're working on when we show that um, white identity politics is one of the biggest drivers of resistance to COVID-19 restrictions. So it's, it, it's when you enter into these identitarian uh, 
conflicts that are driven by regime antipathy and, and discuss with the system, uh, it becomes it becomes a major issue. So that's the only one I wanted to con uh, that's the only one I wanted to comment on. So I'll turn it back to you. Okay, you guys are incredibly efficient. So for the first time in weeks, we're able to go on to another round of questions. Um, let me throw out just a few questions um, that are a bit more country specific. I'm not sure I'm going to get to all of you, but but uh, it may not be a question for Miguel, but Miguel, you should feel free to comment on any of them. Um, starting, there are a couple of questions on Chile that are uh, focused, I guess, primarily for Matt. Um, Cristiano Rodriguez asks you to look into the future, Matt, and say something about, um, you do such a good job of explaining the past that we're gonna take you to the next, the next level. Um, say something about the role of tech, the likely role of technocrats or potential role of technocrats in the next government in Chile. It, the way things stand right now, the second round is looking to be to uh, shaping up with, with candidates of uh, uh, on the left and right wing polls. How might we see a change in the role of technocrats in the next elected government in Chile? Uh, and a question that is specific on Chile, but I think could be taken up by anybody uh, regards the, the the degree to which technocrats evolve, particularly over generations. Um, and what, what aren't we likely to see, for example, if there were to be a Boric government in Chile? Uh, Boric sound surrounded by a group of younger technocrats whose expertise and interests and values lay in areas of environmental and food security, indigenous rights, gender rights, et cetera. And are, are, are these technocrats that ought to be um, uh, sort of evaluated in the same way or, or are they uh, somehow different? Uh, I have a question for Eduardo on uh, on Peru. Uh, I know you said that um, that Peruvian tech, that the sort of Washington consensus era technocrats, the old the old guard, was very slow to um, to take up issue of, of inequality and redistribution, and that seems indisputable. But I wanted to get back to a point you made briefly earlier, Eduardo, which is that um, at least in, in in there's been sort of a surprising technocratization of social policy. In the last decade, and that's been under primarily under um, broadly defined left of center populist government. So, why in, in in your framework or or another, why did the left, broadly speaking, in Peru choose to go the technocratic route uh, in terms of social policy? I'm thinking about the Umala and and um, the brief period that we've seen under under Castillo. Um, for Kate, and this will be the last question be, before I shut up and turn to you guys. Uh, could you, I really like your distinction between uh, political and bureaucratic technocrats. Um, and there were a couple of questions in the audience about this. Could you do a little more to just to define it? Tell us how we know a political technocrat when we see one. Is it that they're um, party members, that they, that they display a certain ideology, that they can only be appointed by some gov governments and not others? Uh, Probably Gedges is, is pretty clear, but I was thinking, for example, of uh, Domingo Cavallo, who was termed a uh, technopole in an earlier generation, um, came from the right, was appointed by a Peronist government, but then was brought back by, by a rival government. So he seemed to be a technocrat for all trades. Uh, is, he a, is he a political technocrat or not? How, what are the boundaries of, of political technocrat? And again, uh, Miguel, you should feel free to comment on any or none of those questions. Why don't we go uh, back in the same order, starting with Kate? Okay, thanks for these. Uh, thanks, thanks for these questions. I'm going to hit your question um, uh, first, Steve. How do we know the difference between a, a political technocrat and a bureaucratic technocrat? Uh, this is a question I've struggled with because I think there is a certain, you know, we could define them in two separate groups, but I think there is, there are some who fall into, you know, the center of that Venn diagram um, that are kind of a gray area. The way I have always thought about this is, do these actors come and go with a political actor who appointed them? And, um, and in Brazil, this is a little bit more clear cut. Now, if I was to apply this to, and maybe this is something I should do, think about how this operates in Peru and Chile, it might be different. But in Brazil, because you have these 280,000 civil servants, 
and some of them are appointed and they go back to the civil service, you have a really large pool. So that, that is the defining characteristic I think about. To what extent do they come and go with the political actor? And for bureaucratic technocrats, are they a part of the civil service? Um, and again, that's a little bit more clear in Brazil. Elsewhere, uh, it's, it's a little more difficult. And then I just wanted to briefly mention on this question of uh, thinking about how technocrats evolve over time. And I think that this, this is something that as I was preparing my notes for this talk, I was really thinking about how much of a change we've seen in the last 25 years in Brazil and how some of those, you know, we were talking before about values. And I think political technocrats, some of their values, at least during the neoliberal era were clear. But today, when we think about values in amongst the bureaucratic technocrats, there is a strong sense of dedication to participation, transparency. And so I think it is interesting to see how that's transformed over time with more democratic experience and different types um, of influences. Uh, and I'll conclude my comments there, thanks. Thanks. Um, I think Miguel had to do some de emergency deaning, so we'll pass the baton to Eduardo. He's back. <laughs> Should I go ahead then? Oh. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So the question of, in Peru, like, it's a tough one. Uh, if we imagine that the, the scenario is always the same and we look back at the 80s, 90s, 2000s as if things were similar, one will say, uh, one will think, how can uh, uh, left, not, I will not say left wing, but leaders that were elected towards the left as Humala, we choose to build a, a social policy technocracy. And part of the answer, I believe, is that the, 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 the system in that moment was kind of plural in terms of power, maybe not democratic pluralism, but there were very strong demands to uh, accuse Humala that he was going to do something like Chavismo, that he was going to clientelize the bureaucracy. So somehow he was very careful to uh, try to signal that he was respecting certain boundaries in part because power was uh, unbalanced. And, you know, quite in Peru, it's quite easy that a, a president loses uh, legitimacy and, and, and popularity quite, uh, quite quickly. So part of the story, I believe, is the system in which they work. No? But I think there's another deeper story is that the state has changed a lot across the years. No? If you look at the state in the 80s, the state in the 90s, and the state in the 2000s, you have bigger bureaucracies the average bureaucrat is much more uh, an expert now than it was in the past. There are certain rules that have slowly eroded uh, clientelistic uh, possibility for, for politicians. And particularly in Peru, you have the story of the Ministry of Economic Technocracy that was quite powerful and supported by all these uh, powerful actors in business community and in the international system. So when you have to build a social policy technocracy, you have to dialogue with the Minister of Economics and tell them you are you have lost your time, you are expert from the 90s, we have a new brand of experts and you bring in all these kind of social policy experts with credentials from Harvard, Princeton, uh, and all of these other places, but we're doing something different. So it's very difficult to say this is not expert policy. So I think I will put it in those two levels. Great, thanks. Matt? Okay, thanks. Um, I have to say, I think it's a little unfair that I'm the only one who's asked to predict the future. Uh, I should say that uh, in uh, the fall semester of 2016, when I was teaching a course on populism, I gave this whole speech about how the US is really good about generating populism, and good at, equally good at keeping them out, at which point I claimed that Donald Trump would never win. Uh, so as you can imagine, I'm a little bit gun shy about prognostication. So. Um, especially on a recorded talk, so nobody quote me on this. Uh, <laughs> but um, so the role of technocracy in the future. Um, so it's looking increasing like we're going to see either a Boric or a caste government. So, so one or the other breed of political outsiders uh, is going to come in. And I think depending on which of those it is, is going to have a very, they're going to have a very different relationship with the technocracy. Um, caste is, is, is very sort of, right-wing identitarian in his orientation and 
because of that identitarian focus, I think those folks tend to see economic policy details as more of a distraction as anything else. They kind of focus on their hot button issues and signaling to their supporters that they're elevating you know, the tribe. So I think uh, a cost government could be very much reconcilable with an ongoing technocratic alliance, which is, which is what you had in Chile, uh, again, for, for pretty much the entire new democratic period is a synergy of purpose between you know, the political leadership, the political technocrats, and the, and, the, uh, and the bureaucratic technocrats. So I think that would be more likely to continue under cost. If, if Boric comes in, uh, I think that's a, that's a much bigger question. And I think it boils down to how, you know, democratic revolution and these new, and this new sort of broad front or attempt to construct a broad front model faction uh, bringing together all these different protest movements. I, I think it, it, it depends on how they organize themselves no longer as an outsider faction, but as a legit, as a, as a real major political party in Chile. And I can kind of see two pathways that walked in one, and I think is, is probably the most likely, just because this is an insurgent party that doesn't have a lot of experience uh, that, is, that is quite new is that the iron law of oligarchy asserts itself and that this, this group of younger technocrats around Borg, again, separates itself off, stops responding to its base and you know, implements a different set of policies but maintains that disconnection between the state and society that's characterized Chilean politics in the democratic period, at which point a lot of the same legitimacy problems that Chile suffers now are going to continue. Um, if Boric and, 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 this, and this group can pull off kind of a frente amplio from Uruguay model where they manage to establish party institutions in a way that, that, that demand attention to the base in a way that's functional and that doesn't handicap the party's ability to campaign. Uh, I think you could see a real sea change. And I think that's more possible than it might otherwise be simply because the new constitution is a huge wild card. You know, there may very well be institutions coming out of that that are much more beneficial to a kind of mass organized party like that. Um, frankly, I'm not terribly hopeful. I think that these problems of techno technocracy and, and, the, and the lack of voice are going to continue regardless of who ends up triumphing in that election. Thanks. Um, so our friend, Kurt Weiland, who's gotta be understood as sort of a godfather of this panel, um, had a question that I managed to miss so I want to ask it because it's a great question. And that is that uh, he points out that um, one of the prim primary drivers of this sort of um, pendulum swing between populism and technocracy is the weakness of parties. As uh, Miguel pointed out, um, political parties are one way to kind of uh, ensure uh, that, 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 that politics survives. Um, uh, anyway, they, they outside of, of, of Uruguay and, and, and to, to some extent, maybe Costa Rica, parties are weakening across the region. That doesn't seem to likely to be reversed in the short to medium term. And so what, how, how should we think about this? What can be done to save politics from the, these sort of twin um, dangers of populism and technocracy in the absence of even minimally stable parties. Uh, anyone want to take a crack at that? We've got about five minutes. Sure. Yeah, that would be, be great. Yeah, if, if I, Kurt, if I could figure out how to resuscitate politics from these two threats, um, you know, I'll, I'll be higher. Uh, I, I'll just point out that I think there's a very good correlation, and I would even say causation, between the weaknesses of these of political parties and this sort of uh, uh, fight between technocracy and populism. And notice not just Latin America, is there a political party? I mean, other than in Uruguay and Costa Rica, is there a political party in Latin America that has survived for longer than 20 years? I mean, even the PRI has almost uh, th th disappeared. Uh, uh, so, but it's not just true in Latin America, it's also true in Europe, and certainly it's true in the United States. <laughs> Both, you know, the ability of a party to impose some kind of party discipline. I mean, even Brexit, we could blame Brexit on, uh, uh, on the inability of Cameron to be able to impose discipline on the Conservative Party and choosing to let this out. We, we've seen it with Trump. We see it still with the legislative battles inside the Democratic Party. Uh, 
So I think you're right. I think that the very institution, it's not just a question of, um, uh, of a, 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 a 21st century culture. I think it's simply that the, the institutions of politics have been so delegitimized. De and so disempowered that it's very, very hard for a politician, in a sense, to argue against both the technocratic expertise or the populist desire. Thanks. Uh, I will give it a, a shot. Uh, I believe that the diagnosis is absolutely right. Uh, the moment you lose this kind of political muscle and you send technocrats just to do the reform, you see what you see in Colombia, Peru these days, that is that they are not, uh, they don't have bodyguards, no? They are like, they have to discuss politically in terms that they don't, they don't follow. And the, the horizon gets shorter, no? The health reform in Colombia was pushed by Álvaro Uribe. He was then a, a senator, no? In the Colombian Congress. And he learned about the issue, pushed for it. You may like or not like Uribe, but he carried out that reform with the support of experts, no? When you don't have those horizons, when you don't campaign on your policies, uh, and when you have a cabinet full of experts and not politicians, there seems to be something very big missing. How to solve it? The only way I think that you can solve it is that uh, we have to understand that technologies are no longer popular in the in the in the democratic realm. I think uh, uh, they have failed in being them their own the leading actors many times. So there seems to be a recipe to try to bring them back to the cooking room and to prepare policies and to put them at the orders of uh, politicians that can learn about policy. So it's trying to bring back politicians and experts together for a while. No? It makes sense that uh, in Peru, they would bring them back to the cooking room. I, I get that. Kate? So uh, great question, Kurt. I don't have uh, the big answer. But just an observation, which is, I mean, something that I've always thought is interesting in Brazil is a sentiment that politics is so broken and there's so much um, uh, at the elite political level of paying people off that many of the bureaucratic technocrats would actually seek to leverage participation in order to advance what they thought were their own uh, objectives, which I don't think is the solution, but somehow I think advancing participation and reducing exclusion it is. And I think that we see some seeds of that in, in some countries around, around the region. Matt, do you wanna jump in? If not, I can ask you if Trump's gonna win in 2024. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I can, um, I, can, uh, I, I can throw in here, although, I, more more of an aside than an answer. One of the things I think that is interesting that I've just I've seen, um, not so much from from local technocrats in Latin America, but particularly from technocrats in you know the international development community and things like that, is that they they've suddenly uh, it's it's almost become trendy to try and adopt things like sort of direct democracy, sort of participatory democracy uh, for us. So participatory budgeting is was hot for a while and and, and continues to be in those circles. Um, trying to adopt sort of these locally bounded, uh, cut out the middleman kinds of participatory systems to try and kind of re-engage the citizenry. And I think Kurt's question really goes to something important, which is that those are both limited and can be counterproductive. One of the things I argue in my book is that by sort of redirecting people's energies into these locally bounded participatory institutions, it can actually cause people to neglect national political dynamics and it, that can actually contribute to the weakening of parties uh, and, and of, of party structures. So I think Kurt's right. And I, as the panel has is sort of has a consensus on, this is a really difficult challenge, but it really is the reinvigoration of parties that is sort of the way out of this problem. And um, again, how that is done, I don't know at the very least, there will need to be sort of institutional reforms that make highly mobilized mass-based parties compet electorally competitive so that you have incentives to develop that kind of party. But other than that, I'm, I'm as clueless as the rest of the panel. Thanks, guys. That was a valiant effort at a, at a very tough question. Um, I need to close, but I want to, first of all, um, thank Catherine Birch, Miguel Angel Centeno, Eduardo Dargent, 
and Matthew Rhodes Purdy for taking the time and sharing your your uh, insights and your knowledge. Uh, and secondly, to remind you or ask you to come back next week, we've got a uh, really interesting panel on uh, protest and repression in contemporary Latin America. Um, have a great weekend.